Well, no, I'm not instead of a submarine. We are over at Kindred Hospital in the Hyperbaric Chamber Program. And today, right there, is Mariah Anstead. She's the Program Director of the Hyperbaric Program. Thank you for being here. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for, and you know, finally, I'm, I'm glad to get here. Thanks for the invitation, though. Yeah, absolutely. This has been, what, a year in the making? Maybe a two? Couple. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll blame it on COVID. How's that sound? Cool. Okay, good. Well, as you can see here, this this is just, this is the main control panel, right? Yeah. Now we have two hyperbaric chambers, and one behind the camera, and one, you can see the gray, the color over there, that's, that's the other one. Uh, and Mariah and I are gonna talk about what it does, why they're doing it, and how it helps people. So, you sit out here, right, when the people are inside. People are inside this chamber, by the way. <laughs> it's like a submarine, I love this. And you basically, you can see them up there on the, on the screen. Right and you control what goes on here, right? Yeah, so the two chambers are exactly the same, and then when we're out here, we can drive the chamber a couple different ways. One of them is by computer, so it's set for certain parameters, and then when we're out here with it, we just make sure that it doesn't go beyond that or that the machine doesn't malfunction. And then when we bring the chamber up, when the dive is done, because the chamber would just stay down. You know, it wouldn't bring it back up, so we have to do that. Okay. And then when we're out here, we're also monitoring uh, the temperature, the humidity, the percentage of oxygen inside the chamber, that there's enough pressure in the lines, that all the gauges are reading properly. Um, because if something goes wrong, then we can fix it right away. Good. And keep everybody safe. <laughs> yeah. And then inside the chamber with the patients, there's always one of us as well to make oh. sure that they stay safe, that we're hands-on because there's a lot of different things that can happen inside the chamber. Because sure. um, when you go in there, it feels like you're going up in an airplane or up in the mountains, and you need oh, to clear wow. that pressure. And some people, either they don't understand the concept of clearing their ears, or they've had uh, past medical history, chronic ear infections, where it makes it really hard. So we have to stop the chamber from moving, talk them through it, and if we can get them down, then that's good. But if we can't, then we don't want to rupture an eardrum, so we bring them back to the surface, and then they go to an EFT doctor to get the tubes put in, and then they don't have to worry about clearing their ears. So is it more like being in an airplane or being in a submarine, or both? Well, I've never been in a submarine, so I would equate it to an airplane, okay. what it feels like. Because right. um, when we start the dive, it gets a little bit loud, gets kind of hot and humid, and that's when you start feeling the pressure change in your ears. Oh, okay. And when we get to 40 feet of seawater or 2.2 atmospheres, then we're down at the farthest we're gonna go. And then it levels off, gets nice and cool, kind of like the room feels right now. And then you don't have to worry about clearing your ears because that's the farthest we're gonna go. Okay. And then on the way back up, it gets nice and chilly in there. And then your ears it feel- It gets freezing. It gets freezing. <laughs> it gets freezing. Um, and then your ears clear by themselves. So it's like when you pour milk on Rice Krispies, you feel that crackle pop sound, yeah. but that's normal. Okay. So on the way back up, your ears should do just fine. All right. Um, some people too, um, especially veterans who've been in war, they have claustrophobia or anxiety. This is really good for them because these are the biggest chambers in the valley. Yeah, so if that's you can go, saying. Yeah, if you can go in an elevator and be okay, if you can go into a small bathroom and be okay, then you'll be perfectly fine in this. I know some people that are deathly afraid of elevators and highly claustrophobic when it comes to being inside of a tube. Mm -hmm. I think you met one yesterday. I did. I this did. is where we say, hi, John. Hi, John. <laughs> and this, you can't see him, he's off camera right now, but that's Joe over there. We're gonna have Joe, who is a, an, an army vet, and we'll have him on in a little bit. Okay, the big, the big question I have, and I'm sure a lot of people do, what's it for? What, what, what is the, the main purpose of the hyperbaric chamber, other than what you kind of described already? So there's about 15 indications that we can treat for per Medicare guidelines. And Medicare is just like the governing body. Like if Medicare will cover the procedure for a diagnosis, then most other insurance companies will follow oh, suit. So there's 15 indications that we can treat for. Um, the most common ones are chronic diabetic foot wounds. So you've had this wound for a certain length of time, it's a certain depth. They've tried other modalities to fix it and those have failed. Now you're a candidate for hyperbarics. Oh, wow. So what hyperbarics does is it promotes new vessel growth, new tissue growth. And the way that that works is when we pressurize your body to 40 feet of seawater, you're able to take on more oxygen than you can on the surface. Oh. So it super saturates your body with oxygen 
and it won't just go to the area where the damage is, it goes everywhere. So a lot of people notice that their hair grows faster, fingernails grow faster, men have to shave more often. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring back that um, circulation to that area. So uh, new tissue growth, new cell growth, um, heal you from the inside out. So like if somebody has, for example, diabetes and uh, neuropathy, um, you know, from, like say from the top of their knees down to their feet, mm -hmm. um, that could help them? So it's more for chronic wounds. Okay. Now, if they have neuropathy on top of the chronic wounds, they might notice a difference. Everybody is a little bit different. Okay. So some people notice that it might make it a little bit better, but it's not going to stay that way. Okay. So what we're really trying to do is just heal that area where the wound is. Um, also, there's a type of infection called osteomyelitis, which is a bone infection. Oops. So you have to have had it for um, a six weeks course of antibiotics, and then you're a candidate for hyperbaric. So they have to try various different things before you can come to us. But with hyperbarics, what it does is it doesn't necessarily get rid of the infection, but it weakens it so the antibiotics can take hold of it and get rid of oh, it. Oh, wow, good. Yeah. I mean, being a sports guy, I remember when the uh, Detroit Red Wings back in, the, I think it was like the mid 90s, they had a portable hyperbaric chamber. Mm -hmm. And, and the guys who were getting injured, they seem to be back on the ice sooner than uh, most people. Well, and this is, this is a really cool thing because you can use it for a multitude of things. So not just what we can treat for. Um, the reason that we're only geared for about the 15 indications is because we're attached to a hospital. Okay. If you're not attached to a hospital and you're a freestanding clinic and you're not charging the insurance and you're doing a cash pay basis, you can really kind of treat for anything that you want. I mean, it has to have research behind it, sure. or should anyway. Yeah. Um, so Alzheimer's, autism, traumatic brain injuries, they did a study with people that would come back from war with PTSD and stuff like that. Sure. Um, so they did it, I think there were three locations in the United States that did a research for it. Um, I had a guy that I used to work with who worked at a freestanding clinic one time and he was treating a 16 year old girl who um, nearly drowned and she had short-term memory loss oh. and so every day she would come in and she would always have to reintroduce herself to everybody because she didn't remember and then she came in around number 40 and she said you're Brian aren't you so where it, it might yeah where it might seem small that's huge for I, her oh sure yeah yeah wow. and we have patients who come to us and they've tried various different things wound care antibiotics and they're really getting down about what they have going on. And they have the support system at home, but they don't have somebody who really has the same issues. So then they come here and they talk between the patients. They get to know each other. They go Good. for coffees. It's getting them out of their, you know, horrible mindset that they have, you know? Um, they wake back up. Oh, wow, that's outstanding. It feels that way, yeah. you know? Because they, when they first come to us, they're a little bit agitated. They don't want to come. It's intimidating. But sure. then after a couple of days, they look forward to coming. Now, the big uh, thing with professional football, or even high-level college football, is the head injuries, mm -hmm. the CTE injuries, right? right? Now, I know that uh, it, it, the NFL has really taken a strong stance on getting these players help. Is something like this beneficial for them? It could be. Okay. Um, so we've had patients in the past where we're not treating them for the Alzheimer's or dementia. We're treating them for something else. Okay. But we can notice a difference with them. So I had a patient one time who had a wound on her back, osteomyelitis, which is the bone infection, and she hadn't spoken in years. And so she started yelling at me in a language I didn't understand. Oh. Um, turns out it was Farsi, but I talked to her daughter and she told me how to calm her down how to talk to her, say a couple things in Farsi. And she had that time with her mother that she wouldn't have had. Now, it's not gonna stay. Well, it, but, it happened. Yeah, but it was wow. there, she got that time. Now, was Farsi her language, her first language mm -hmm. or second? Okay. Yeah. I, you know, sometimes you wonder, why is she speaking this language? She doesn't even know it, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, no, that was yeah. her okay, native good. language, yeah. Well, that, that's, that's kind of a relief there, huh? Yeah. Um, Sitting out here, I'm just amazed. I saw you, you, you one, guy, one guy came in here and started turning all these knobs. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? If, now I do feel like I'm in a submarine. All right. What does some of this stuff do here? 
Um, so we have the two uh, TV monitors, so we outside can see what's going on inside. Okay. Um, and then these uh, squares here are the computers. This is a way that we can communicate with the people on the inside. Also, we have the headset that we can use. Okay. Um, over there where the fire alarm is, our, is our deluge system. So when we go inside the chamber, we have to make sure that we're um, very cognizant of everything that's going on. So oh, sure. emergency procedures and everything like that. And we have the chambers that are um, not filled with 100% oxygen, but they have enough in there to where all you're looking for is that ignition source. Okay. So we have multiple ways to light off the deluge system inside, multiple ways to do it on the outside. Um, we have the med lock over there where we can send down small items. We have a larger transfer chamber that we can either send one of us down or switch tenders. So there's a lot of different things that we can do to keep everybody safe. Okay. And then those blue squares right there, uh, those tell us the amount of oxygen inside the chamber at one time. So we want it to be 21% oxygen inside the chamber. Oh wow. Um, if it's above that, then we have to vent out the excess amount. Um, if it's below that, then we're venting too much so we can accommodate the vent rate. So there is such a thing as too much good or real oxygen or, or pumped in oxygen. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. You hear, I mean, us being in Las Vegas, we hear these stories all the time. Oh, the casinos pump in oxygen to, to keep all their customers uh, or people awake so they can spend more money. You think that's something that it could be true? Okay, I didn't think so. You heard it first right here. No. <laughs> when they talk about oxygen bars too, helping you feel like um, if you have a hangover, it's not anything more than just being hooked up to a wall unit. <laughs> they charge good money for it. They do. And I'm they in the wrong line of business. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, this is absolutely incredible. Now, what's the average length that somebody comes in for treatments? Um, or is so there such a thing? There is. Okay. So they're evaluated by a hyperbaric physician. Okay. Um, somebody who's gone to school, does hyperbarics, does wound care. Because we need to make sure that we look at everything. So even if you say that you have the diabetic wound, we need to make sure that you don't have any other pre-existing conditions that could um, cause something to happen while you're in there. Right. Um, so the doctor takes a look at you, he'll write the order. We normally start out with 20 treatments. Okay. And then you'll be reevaluated through those course of treatments to find out, number one, if it's working for you, and number two, if we feel that you can benefit even more from, say, 40 or 60 treatments. Now, is there like, okay, let's say 60 treatments, that's what the doctor says, you, you can get 60 treatments. Is there a break period, like you do 20, then you gotta take a, a month off to come back, or, or does it matter? So it works on a consecutive basis. Okay. So the more you come, the better chance you have of it working. Okay. Uh, really very compliant patients like Joe who come every day, he has a great benefit from it. Good. Um, somebody who doesn't come every day like they're supposed to, say they only come two or three times a week, they're not gonna see the benefit that Joe sees. Okay, that's outstanding. Wow. I, that, is this awesome or what? We're gonna go inside of one here pretty soon, so we'll stay tuned for that one. Um, I, I just, I don't know what else to say. I'm so blown away with this. When we first talked, it's, I'm thinking, okay, it's one of those things you slide in on a gurney, you know, and oh, that, that's cool. Because I, I saw one of those ones before. Right. The Red Wings had one, or had one. They got, they got a, uh, looks like one of those sheds now in, in their uh, locker room, just outside of their locker room. When there are multiple different kinds of chambers, so you have these, which are the multi-place, meaning more than one person can go in. Okay. Then you have the more stationary mono-place chambers, which are similar in shape, but you get slid in on a gurney and you're by yourself. Oh. It does the same thing. Okay. Um, but if you're claustrophobic, that's really not a good thing. I would probably qualify for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, then they have ones that are more portable, like the sports teams use. Sure. And then they have ones that are just dedicated to animals. Oh, really? Yeah. So they have them at horse rehabilitation centers uh, for the racehorses. Nice. Um, they have them at certain veterinary offices because animals can get the same injuries that we can. Um, so there's a whole lot of things that hyperbarics can help with, not just for humans, but for animals too. It seems to me that we're not gonna be able to give everybody uh, all the information that you need today. Mm. So I'm thinking this might even be, end up being a series. I would love that. That'd be awesome, yeah. Come in and talk to people like Joe and anybody else you bring in. 
they can say, hey, this is how it's really helping. So, because what you have here, this is first class. Uh, is there anybody else in, in Nevada that has something like this? So we have the largest chambers in the valley. Okay. All the other area hospitals, they do have hyperbarics, okay. but they're the monoplace chambers, oh. the ones where you get slid in on the gurney by yourself, okay. and where they do the same thing, there's the same benefit. Um, this is just on a bit of a grander scale. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, like I said, it does help for people who have claustrophobia or anxiety, and just knowing the fact that you're not by yourself in there really does help. Yeah. yeah. And I think in the 18 years that I've been here, there's maybe been two or three people that just couldn't. Really? But they had extenuating circumstances okay. why they couldn't. All right. So it was it was really understandable. Well, Mariah, this is incredibly educational, mm -hmm. and I'm glad that I finally got over here. I After two years, Joe. Yeah. It took me two years to get in. I live 10 miles away. You know, it took me two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mariah, thank you. Well, you did a great job with this.